All right. So, uh, what I, the speed of light is much too slow for our daily lives, um, and it's a problem. And it's a problem that's difficult to fix. And what I want to talk about is how the speed of light is ruining your life. Um, unfortunately, it's difficult to fix. So, some time ago, my clicker will work. Can you make my clicker work? Hello? Okay, some time ago I was walking down the street listening to Fast and the Speed of Night by Bonnie Tyler, and the song came to an end, and I had this song on my, on my iPhone, I don't mind admitting that, and I, the song came to an end, and it switched to another song, which was a U2 song, which I don't actually own. You see, the speed of light is really bad because this clicker doesn't work. So this U2 song came up, and this is the period at which Apple had decided with Bono to give everybody a U2 album they didn't want. And uh, obviously I was like, this is, a, this is a nuisance, but what's interesting about it is it started streaming into my phone instantaneously, and I was listening to this music, and it's interesting to think about how that managed to happen. And then I was kind of mad about this, so I said, okay, I want a U2 removal tool. So I, went, I immediately went to Google and tried to Google it, and what happened was this song started playing really quickly. Then when I went on the web, there was this massive delay where I was like, what's happening? Why is there this delay? And there's something, these two things tell you something interesting about the speed of light. And after a while, on the next slide, it came up. So you actually had like, okay, the, the album, there is a tool to remove this album if you really, really don't want it. Okay, now what's happening here is really to do with bandwidth. So over time, so when I started doing stuff with computers, there's this, uh, slide with a modem on it. This was a 1200 board modem, 1200 bits per second uh, on the next slide, slide six. And over time, we got faster and faster, right? So uh, on the next one, you've got this modem, which is 1400 kilo, 14 kilobits per second, and then we got uh, 56 kilobits per second. And over time, the internet has got faster and faster, right? So this is kind of like, since 2011, the latest kind of figures, average broadband speed in the world is it's just going up, right? So we think everything's getting faster and faster, but still the web is too slow. And fundamentally, it doesn't actually matter in some ways how fast you make computers. Uh, the speed of light is a problem. The speed of light really gets in the way. Now, the speed of light seems fast. Well, okay, it seems fast if you use real units. Um, 300,000 kilometers per second. That seems like a really, really long way. Um, unfortunately, as much as we've increased bandwidth available to your phone and to your home, we've made no progress at all on the speed of light. This is actually the change in the speed of light since 1996. Um, we've got nowhere on it at all, despite our best efforts. Um, so I don't know what physicists are even doing. So how does the speed of light mess up your life? Okay, so this is Voyager. Voyager is the furthest man-made object from us. It's left our solar system. It's still somehow pointing at us, and occasionally we talk to it. And when we talk to it, we get a reply. Well, we get a reply at about the speed at which my mother answers WhatsApp messages, which is 40 hours later. Um, and 40 hours later, it comes back, because it's so far away, and it's going at the speed of light. And so, okay, Voyager's really, really far away, and you're like, what's that got to do with the web? Well, here we are in Berlin, and a hundredth of a second away is this circle. So if you're at the speed of light, if you flash a really bright laser in Berlin, it'll take about 10 milliseconds, about a hundredth of a second to reach London or this circle here. And it's not quite a circle because guess what? We're living on a globe, and so it's not quite circular. So I try going to the website of this festival um, on my web browser, and everyone's experience is a slight sort of delay. You're kind of like, it's going to come, boom, and it appears. And then I got out a thing called a protocol analyzer, and I, here you go, here's some techie stuff. Um, this shows you the back and forth between my computer at home and the website. Now, what's interesting in here, ignore all the technical detail, I put some arrows on here. This is the back and forth. This is my browser saying, hey, I'd like to, do, I'd like to talk to you. And the, it says, oh, okay. And he said, what do you want? I want to have this. He said, what do you need to go over here for that? And every time you do this back and forth, you incur a delay of the speed of light. Right? So you have to go somewhere. And the further away that machine is, the worse this is. And this goes on for pages. This is not just you're going back and forth over and over again. In fact, it goes on for almost two seconds. And that's what happens to all of us on mobile phones, on our computers. This is back and forth with the server. Now, that's what was happening to me on my phone when I was trying to find the, the tool to get rid of the U2 album I didn't want. Now, in perfect conditions, you might have a stable, uh, stable speed of light, but 
The speed of light may be constant, but the network conditions are not. And this is when I was actually doing this. This graph shows that the network conditions went to hell in the middle of me trying to download the website. So, this, so things changed. So, OK, so interesting question. What's the uh, fastest way to move data from London to Singapore related to this? Well, I was at Heathrow this morning, and I took this picture. And I guess you can't really see it. So if I enhance a bit, uh, this is the fastest way to move data from London to Singapore. Uh, this is an A380. And Believe me, it's the fastest way. Let me tell you how fast it is. If you fill that with tape, because tape is the most dense thing you've got out there, uh, the best way you can, you can fit 750,000 12 terabit tapes inside an A380. I'm not sure Singapore Airlines will let you carry that on, but let's just suppose you could. And that will give you nine exabytes of data. And if it flies to Singapore in about 13 hours, its bandwidth is one and a half petabits per second. Now, that's great. Um, by the way, it's got fast. We've actually got better. Planes have stayed the same speed, but since 2010, we're now at 95 terabits per second. So we've gone up in terms of speed. But that's one way. Now, you might think that's a complete joke, but if you have uh, Amazon Web Services and you have lots of data to move, this is how Amazon will move it for you. They will drive this truck to your data center, they will suck data into it, and they will truck it to Amazon. So if you want to go one way, that's a really practical way of moving very large data. That's just full of disks, basically. And that's why, so that's why um, my song got quickly onto my phone, was because there was all this just, it was just being thrown at me. There's no back and forth. So, so I tried just, just to show you to illustrate this. I went to look at a song on YouTube, an 80s classic, and I used the same protocol analyzer. And here's what happens. If you look at the arrows here at the top, my YouTube, I go to YouTube and say, give me this video. And it just goes, here it is, here it is, here it is. Right? There's, there's hardly any back and forth. Um, just to help put this in perspective, because the speed of light is rather fast, I have a nanosecond, uh, which you could, I have some with me, which I'll give away to anybody they want. The, at the speed of light, light moves about 30 centi centimeters in a billionth of a second. Now, so, it's, so if it's on A4, and you can download this and print out a nanosecond if you want, it's about that far. Why does a billionth of a second matter? Well, it turns out this is a nuisance as we build more faster and faster machines. So in the 70s, there was a computer called the Cray, the Cray 1, and it's this weird circular shape. And the reason it's that shape is you want to have all the cables be as short as possible and all the same length, because the speed of light is a nuisance. And so you have to pack it in as tight as you can. Today, we make stuff like um, the Core i5, which has got transistors stuck in it, but you still have this problem. And just to get, illustrate like, what's happening inside a processor, if you're typing on a keyboard, this is you typing on a keyboard, you are really slow compared to a processor. So you do about three keystrokes per second if you're a reasonable typist. Uh, your, the CPU in your laptop does about 54 billion instructions in a second. So between your keystrokes, it does 18 billion instructions. This is like, uh, just to give you a sense of what that's like, if we slowed it down so the instruction was happening every second, just to give you the perspective of being inside a CPU, um, it's the 1400s Donatello is creating this masterpiece when you hit one key, and then it sits there, and it waits for you to hit the next key, and this happens. Right? It's 400 years later, or 500 years later. That's how slow it is if you're inside the CPU, because it's just incredibly slow. So we're trying to make things really, really fast. There's so much you can do. And one of the reasons why computing has got so much better is we've moved all that computing power away from data centers, where it's tied to the speed of light, because it's far away from you, into your pocket on your, on your phone. That's why the phone is so powerful. Now, suppose we go to Mars. It's going to suck. Um, depending on where Mars is, it's been six to 44 minutes to get a message back and forth. So, so if Elon gets there, browsing the web is going to be awful. And he's not going to be happy. right? So the only solution, and this is one of the reasons why Elon Musk wants to build these big uh, constellations of satellites and put the web up there, is so he can move the whole web onto Mars and then be happy while he's there. Well, OK, so we're not on Mars, and, and you know, Mars is very far away. But on Earth, there are uh, some places that are fairly far away. The equivalent of Mars on Earth is New Zealand. I'm sorry to anybody from New Zealand who's here. Uh, but New Zealand is very, very far away. How far away is it? Well, it's over here. It's in the corner. Um, and uh, the Pacific's gone, of course. But to give you a perspective of how far away it is, suppose you're in New Zealand, and you go to a website that is in San Francisco. It's 80 milliseconds. And that's every time you go back for a piece of information, you incur that cost. Uh, if you go to one in Berlin, it's even further away, it's 120 milliseconds. So you quite often hear people who come from New Zealand and Australia say things like, wow, the web works so much better in Europe or in the US. And it doesn't. It's just that it's closer, right? The, most, the machines are here in, in this location. So what are we going to do about this problem, right? This problem, the speed of light. Well, oh, well, one thing we can do is we can move New Zealand closer. That would help. Um, 
I mean, you've got to choose between that and speeding up the speed of light. I mean, I'm not sure which is going to work better. Um, the other thing is you could move computing power closer to New Zealand, um, which is kind of what people do. To illustrate this problem, I want to tell you about drone walking dogs. Now, I know that after this, three people are going to start startups doing drone walking, drones that walk dogs. Um, but let's suppose this exists. Let's suppose there are drones out there that take your dog for a walk, right? So you go out for a walk. What's the drone doing? Well, the drone is looking at its location. It's following some sort of route. It's perhaps looking at your dog to see if the dog needs to have a rest with its camera. And all that computing is happening inside the drone. So the speed of light isn't really affecting it, right? So it's, it's fairly close. Um, it's not having to go to some server far away and ask a question about what's going on. It's just, well, dog's fine. Now, of course, this is great, but this is going to be super popular, right? So what's going to happen is everyone's going to be walking their dogs with drones um, because, of course, they got dogs, so they don't want to spend time with them, clearly. Um, and so now you've got all sorts of things going on here. So now drones are going to be avoiding each other. That's fairly OK, because they're close to each other. And if you remember, a nanosecond is about this long. So dogs close to each other, they can communicate fairly fast without any problem about banging into each other. Um, the cameras on the, on the drones can be looking at the other dogs, and figuring out where there's other dogs, following the dogs, trying to do some sort of uh, lead untangling algorithm. right? So, the, so that, that's all fairly close. And it's probably going to do some sort of, oh, is that a dog or is that a human kind of detection, what I called snout detection here, what we'd call face detection. So that's great. That's all happening locally. Now, suppose your dog hates some dog. So there's that one dog, right, who's a pain. And your dog is going to argue with it. So you want to avoid that dog. So you then go and you say, all right, this dog is a bad dog. My dog should you know, not be allowed to go near it. Um, stop that from happening. So now we're going to do snout detection. We're going to find dogs happening in the drone. And we're going to try and do snout recognition. Is that the dog that my dog hates? Um, so that you know, this sort of stuff doesn't happen, right? So you start having an argument going on. This is where things get complicated. Is the drone going to have enough compute power to recognize the other dogs? Now, what's, this is a real example, actually, not with drones, but with uh, CCTV cameras, where they might recognize a face but not know who it is. And so they go and talk to some data center, some, they upload an image and say, I found a face. In this case, I found a dog. Is this the bad dog that my dog hates? Okay. Now, where you do that is critical, because if you do that on a data center which is far away, somewhere in the cloud, by the way, the cloud is just someone else's computer, right? It's not your computer, it's someone else's. You just don't know where it is. Um, it might be far away. And because you're incurring this cost of the speed of light, of like, is that the bad dog? Here's an image. And there's all this back and forth. And by that time, the dogs are in an argument because of this. And as we get more and more low-powered devices, this becomes a more interesting problem because you can't necessarily move all the compute power into something that the consumer expects to be cheap. Right? So you're trying to have low-powered devices on what's called the edge in the, in the devices. And um, on the other side, you have uh, compute happening here. So what do you do about this? Well, the real purpose of this whole talk is to tell you there's a thing coming called edge computing. If I can make that come. Ta-da! There you go, edge computing. You're going to hear this term a lot. What is edge computing? It really means moving computing close to end users. So um, right now, there's sort of two places where computation happens. There's in the device you have, that's your phone, your Fitbit, your watch, your laptop, and on some server somewhere else in the cloud, which is somewhere. But there are only so many places those big server farms can be. So there's a new thing which is called edge computing, which is to put some amount of compute, maybe it's that snout recognition and snout detection, close to the end user. So the company I work for does this. So if you look at the population of the world, um, you have the, the reddish areas are where all the people are and where my company currently has compute. So you can put some little bit of compute. So you, in all these places in the world, you can have dog walking drones that do uh, you know, bad dog detection. And as we build it out, we build it out to cover the population. So lots of stuff needs to happen in West Africa right now and some parts of Central Asia. And around those data centers, I put some circles which are 10 milliseconds. So we're trying to cover the world so that there is compute power close to people. And what's going to happen is developers are going to start to think about not is my application on the device or in a server somewhere, but what portion of it do I push near to the end user because I can make a better application. 
And the result of that is that you end up with devices that are cheaper, because you don't need to have such a powerful CPU in the device, like the drone, or a camera, or a Fitbit, or something like that. And you can update that software really, really quickly. Because one of the big problems, it's great putting something on a phone. You have some really great experience you built. And then people don't update it. If you can push it out to the edge of the network where you've dealt with the speed of light, you know, you, you've given up trying to move New Zealand, you just push it out to the edge of the network and you update it rapidly, people will get richer experiences. But it's going to change slightly how we build applications. So you'll see this edge computing term get used. And ultimately, what will happen is compute will get pushed into things like cell phone antennas all over the world, right there on the edge. So you get a very, very fast experience. So I'll leave you with this thought. Edge computing is coming. It's a new thing. Uh, the speed of light is too darn slow, but there's not much we can do about it. And I think that's the end of my time, and I have time for questions. Thank you very, very much. Would you uh, take a seat with yep. me over here? We can go to the audience uh, questions. Uh, let me see. So um, somebody asks, with websites, uh, with, sorry, websites with ads removed have shown to load over 100 times faster. Isn't the overload of ad tech our fault uh, or at fault for our shitty internet? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, do you want a more nuanced answer than that? I mean, no, yes, no, is, I mean, yes is honest. I like it. So, yes, I mean, uh, so personally, on my web browser, I use a thing called Disconnect, which deletes ads, deletes all sorts of trackers and stuff like that. And I've used it for so long that I've forgotten that, in fact, there are these horrible experiences with, uh, with the slow web. But yes, all this stuff that's added in does add load, right? So, if you think about all that back and forth with the website, I just showed you just getting the, the front page and not even the images of the TOA website. If you then add ads and trackers and all this kind of stuff, it, it does create problems. Um, the obvious question, the obvious thing to say is, well, what's the alternative, right? We have to, then you have to start paying for stuff. Some, someone's paying for it, that service to work, so. Excellent. Um, and uh, somebody offers, why, or somebody asks, why don't you offer free DNS like 1.1.1.1 with uh, Cloudflare? No, we do, right? So Cloudflare offers this DNS service called 1.1.1.1.1, which is a free DNS service. It's the fastest in the world. Why do we offer it? We also, op we also operate uh, for people 9 million websites. And by doing our own DNS that people, end users use, like you and me, those customers actually end up seeing their websites get faster because if you come to us for both the, what's called the authoritative, which is your real DNS, and your personal DNS, it turns out it's way, way faster. That's why we do it. So it's a, a win for, for just normal users at home and a win for your customers as well if they use it. Excellent. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the big question is, what do you think about quantum networking? I know nothing about quantum networking other than it's not here yet. That's fair. That's fair. I like the honesty. Um, and let me see. Um, with uh, somebody asks, will this lead to homogenous landscape on the web? Only a few providers powering everything. What do you think about that? I think it's very likely that uh, there are a small number of providers where people go to for edge computing, just as there are actually today for cloud. So if you think about cloud, there's Amazon, Google, Azure. And there may be a few other smaller players. But it's not uncommon, right, in any market that you'd have a small number. So it's very likely there will be a small number of people who do edge computing. The critical thing is, is the edge computing platform they're providing as open as possible so you can move around? I think that's the key future. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. Cheers. Now, give another round of applause. Thank you very much.